I would like to say welcome everyone. Um, this is Dr. Paul and you're welcome to the Bridges Show. Um, we do a lot of things about a lot of things, but mostly we want to get our information, understanding and action because that is the purpose of unity and service. I have Mr. Admiral Vince Leggett here of the Chesapeake Bay, but we're going to be talking about this month is Black History Month. So let's talk about black history. Mr. Vince, introduce yourself for the people who don't know. Maybe they'll know now. Uh, thank you, Dr. Paul. As you indicated, I'm Vince Leggett. I'm based in Annapolis, Maryland. I describe myself as a country boy out of East Baltimore. And so once your listening audience uh, finished laughing, uh, I'll explain what that means. It means that uh, I'm streetwise and I have a strong work ethic. But uh, most of my body of work uh, has been around the Chesapeake Bay, writing, lecturing, exhibiting, and documenting the contributions that African Americans have made on the Chesapeake Bay as watermen, boat builders, owners of seafood restaurants, uh, captains of ocean going vessels. And so if it hits the water, I'm on top of it. Well, you know, you know, you're, I, you know, most of people, I'll let people know. I'm working with Mr. Vince Leggett on several projects. And the project is he's got the Leggett Group and we are trying to archive black history. And there's been some pushback of getting information about how do you know this is real history? If it's not written down, how do you know if the history is factual? I mean, what's your proof? What's your claims? And I've been hearing these commercials going black history is American history. And I agree with that. But it's sad to think that there is some opposition about the stories. You have the stories, Mr. Leggett. You have the information. Let's talk about those stories. Well, I think what you say is true, and it's been an old battle, but we are from the oral tradition. Even once you go back to the motherland of Africa, they had the griot. They had the keepers of the stories that passed them down around the fireplaces, around the fire pits, uh, an elder who might have been 80 years old has talked about what his grandfather told him and his great father, grandfather told him. And so they continue to pass those legacies around. And so we know the value of the spoken word. So often when we came to the Americas, uh, across the Atlantic to the Caribbean Basin, to South America, and then on to the Chesapeake Bay, uh, let's just take Jamestown, 1619, uh, and even up to the current day, so often we were denied the ability to read and write. And so when the system, and I'll call it the system, presses us for the written record, and then it monishes us because we don't have it recorded, and these are just wise tales or even wives tales. I've heard it described both ways <laughs> or just made up stories that just got passed along or just have mutated and morphed and they don't know what. So that was going to be an uphill challenge, but I think that there are enough uh, scholars and story takers and tellers and truth tellers that slowly that's beginning to evolve, but also we are becoming more adept at finding those written records. Right, right. They Even the slave in, records. Yes, and they are embedded in a white American story. So we are going to find our records standing alone in the archives. So we, you are right now, you're sitting at the archives because you got ready to have an exhibit coming up. Yes. I'm at the uh, Maryland State Archives uh, in Annapolis, Maryland, and one component of uh, Black Life on the B in the 1930s, two African-American women created beaches during a period of segregation. One was called Cars Beach, the second one was called Sparrows Beach, and they had some of the top entertainers, the James Browns, the Little Riches, the Sam Cooks, Sarah Vaughn, Ella Fitzgerald. Uh, Baltimore and Washington were the uh, epicenters of the Chitlin Circuit. Yeah, and they yeah. call it the Chitlin Circuit because many of the musicians and poets and writers could not uh, take advantage of white establishments. And so it was a modern day version of the Underground Railroad. 
where people had safe houses where they could stay. They had safe places where they could play. They had safe places where they could eat at. And even the Green Book, there was a lot of talk that came out that there was a directory created in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s that actually uh, complemented and showcased safe places to travel. So these two beaches in Annapolis were uh, listed in the Green Book. Mm -hmm. and just the fact that two African-American women in the 1930s created these establishments so people of color, African-Americans, could go somewhere and enjoy the Chesapeake Bay. But one part that has not been really told is the economic impact that these businesses had on the local economy. I mean, a James Brown show would have 30,000 people converge on the dirt roads in Annapolis. Wow, wow. Local news articles say it was three or four o'clock in the morning before they cleared all the cars out because it was 20 inside the pavilions, 20,000, and another 20,000 were outside of the pavilion on the roads. So again, the economic impact is something that's often, often overlooked with these kind of venues. Now, now, recently, you worked on an article um, that you were requested to write. Yes. Let's talk about that, because there's a lot of things that extend from there. Now, they requ why, who, requested, who requested it, and why did they request it? The National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, called NOAA, is their acronym, had reached out and for Black History Month, they wanted to learn more about African-American life on the Chesapeake Bay. And they presented me two options. One, that I could write a freestanding story. The second was I could respond to a series of questions. Well, after five or six iterations of question answering, <laughs> we finally got to a point where I was satisfied and they were satisfied because they indicated that there was not a hard word count. But once we got into it, looking at layout, adding photographs, there were some parameters. And so we took the position, we'd rather cut the story to let them cut it. But we still wanted the story to have the salt of the earth in it. Mm -hmm. That so often, uh, African-American Black people have been the salt of the earth. And why do I say salt of the earth, Doc? That's, you know, that's a great, you know, we, people hear it, they've, they've seen it in a movie, but they really don't know what it means. Yes, and, and perhaps you might can help me unpack it as well. But as a lay person, when I talk about the salt of the earth in this context, it's adding the, the seasoning. Mm -hmm. uh, it's adding the meat. It's, it's, it's what ties the whole story together. And I think that that's just so important. Well, you know, one of the other things that I when I did a research on the salt of the earth and, 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 and it's an acronym or not an acronym, but it's a historical use. And I and as far as I've gone back to even people I've talked to in Africa, um, it was talked about because we're from the land, you know, um, with the original man of land. You know, so we had to work the land with our hands and, and everything we did was with our soul. So we poured ourselves into the land. So the working part was very easy for black America or for Africans or for anyone who's because to be a laborer throughout history. Right. You got to remember, yeah, we may have scholars, we had kings, but the majority of people, if our skin color, of dark skin color, were laborers from the Hebrew dark slave to all the way up, you know, so working that land, we are part of it. We don't separate ourselves from it. Do you think that's the type of connection that we have with America? I, I, I think that you really uh, hit a sweet spot there with me because what I would further say is that even through the period of enslavement, mm -hmm. uh, pre-America, that salt was money. <laughs> salt is a preservative. Right. 
And so even as you hunted and harvest, the way to preserve these products were either salting or pickling. That's right, that's right. And when I described myself as a country boy from East Baltimore, when I would go to North Carolina, my granddaddy had a smokehouse and had salted hams hanging up mm. in there. They had salted herrings. They had salted fish. It was used to preserve, and this is one that they would actually cook up some meats and not can them, but jar them. Jar them, right. Jar them, uh, along with the preserves and the pickles and the uh, watermelon rind, uh, cucumbers and those kinds of things. And so it's that preservative. And so I think in this whole historical context that much of the story of preservation and conservation. And by the way, people of color were the first conservationists because we didn't have anything to, to leave behind, anything to waste. We had to be very efficient. Efficient, efficient. Yeah. Because as uh, Langston Hughes said, that if I just got a peck in a corner, <laughs> uh, just give me a little piece. So when Noah, you wrote the article. Did, did the article, is it published out? It's going to come out in uh, next week, and it's going to be in uh, a national magazine and several collateral magazines uh, to just talk about African-American life on the Chesapeake Bay. But one of the things, Doc, is, is that they asked a series of questions that really opened up some veins in my mind and some veins in my heart. Like what? Uh, who were some of the people that really influenced me? And so if I'm doing a stand-up lecture, uh, someone might come to my mind, I'll say the names, and it's sufficient to get through that hour presentation. Right, right. But now that I'm thinking about the question and writing about the question, it was a deeper dive because again, when the question is asked to you or myself or anyone else, who influenced me? So whether it was the Sunday school teacher or the fifth grade teacher or the mm -hmm. basketball mm -hmm. coach or your mama, your daddy, it's so many answers that are correct answers. But when you have to write your response, it's pulling on a different part of you. Right, right. It pulled on a different part of me. And I had a number of honorable mentions. And then I had some that placed and showed. But I kind of got down to the winners and that really had an impact on me. And one thing before I let you back in, there was a period of about four or five years where I lost my son, my mother, my father, and my sister. And somehow the loss of my sister hit me in a spot that the other ones didn't. And I went to a wise spiritual advisor. He said, Vince, they didn't change. You changed. Mm -hmm. All of them hit you. But it's over that period of time, I am an organic living being. Right. And we all are. Like the Vince, perhaps you're the one changing. Go ahead, Doc. We all are organic. I mean, you're right. I mean, it's about recognizing how organic we are. You know, the, one of the things that I don't know when you learned it or how you learned it, but being vulnerable is part of living. And, and, and you open, that's the spot you recognize how vulnerable you, you are. And as black men in a black culture and even in our history, I don't think we as vulnerable as we would i don't think we admit how vulnerable we are and i think that actually holds us back as our cult it holds us back and also holds our culture back yes because one of the persons that i wrote about was a gentleman earl white and so the two people that i featured in this article i didn't realize that both were born in 
1918 and 1919. And I think about my parents were born in 1923 and 1925. Mm -hmm. So those people, that's such an interesting as pre-depression, mm -hmm. but I'm five generations away from enslavement. Right. Five generations away from enslavement, and they are close to my parents' age range. But they spoke about their father and mother. Mm -hmm. They spoke about their grandmama and granddaddy. And so I'm talking to a person born in 1919 and it's 1980 that we're talking. And so they just poured into me in a very special way. I think one, because I had the interest, the passion, but also the aptitude. And they entrusted with me with that oral knowledge, but they were all, one had a third grade education and he was a waterman on the Chesapeake Bay wow. who was wow. born in 1918. He didn't have a written record, but every, his resume was every boat that he'd worked on. Right, right. And when he went down to the dock to work and the captain would say, well, what boat did you work on? He, said, he would name seven or eight boats, but then also said, and then I own a boat. You know, so what do you think Noah got out of this? What do you think, do you, what do you think Noah got out of the article that you've written about black history? I think that during this period of Black Lives Matter. Okay during this period of insurrection at the United States Capitol, mm -hmm. that a lot of that came into full view. Mm. Bill Scott Heron mused that the revolution would not be televised. That's right. But when I turned on MSBC and CNN and Fox News, I saw it televised. That's right. But what I also saw was disparate treatment because I know, Doc, if it was you and myself that knocked out the windows of Burger King, let alone the United States Capitol, it would have been a much different outcome. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of it, but uh, I was not trying to write a feel good story. That what I was trying to do was tell my truth and speak truth to power. You know, one of the things about speaking the truth, it may make you feel good, but it doesn't mean it's a good, it doesn't mean it's a feel good story. Yes. Truth is always spoken, whether it makes someone feel good or it does make someone feel good. And I think, I really think many Americans who are not black, who don't want to hear the story, it's because it makes them feel bad. Because there are still many people out there who understand the black history. But there's many people who don't want to fund it. They understand it, but they don't want to fund it. And I want to talk about that. Why isn't black history funded to be more researched or brought out more? I think a big part of it is, and I'll keep referring to it as the system, that the system has a tendency of working off of their own Rolodex. <laughs> that who has delivered before, or who they have a comfort level with, uh, what are the sponsors and advertisers gonna feel. So I think that all goes into the equation. I think a, another aspect of it is that uh, they, the system, is not going to value our history and heritage any more than we demonstrate we value it. Wow. That's, that, that hurts. I've served on a number of restoration projects of former segregated schools and churches and those things. And once the 
Deacon Board finishes arguing, the grant that we submitted went nowhere hmm. because no one likes to put money in unrest. They'll say, when well, y'all get it together, uh, call us. You're wondering whose name is going to go on the stained glass, who was the best cook. Somehow we get so far down in the weeds as a people. I'm speaking truth to power going north and south, east and west. We have to do better as a people. We have a nationwide, countywide black history program for school kids in Anne Arundel County and Annapolis. White kids win the contest every year. Right. What's up with that, Doc? I was going to ask you. I, 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 I can only guess, but you're the you're the educator. So what? Why do you you tell me? <laughs> I, I and I don't want people to infer or to um, have a perceived. Tell us why do you think they win? The reason I think they win is is that white kids are ingrained in themselves a sense of empowerment from the cradle. And they are taught the way that you stay ahead is know everything you know and everything that they know. Mm -hmm. That's ingrained in them. And they read and they have resources and they go to libraries. Those are three things not many black people do. Correct. Read, resources, and go to the library. Yes, and right now, uh, the world's greatest libraries are sitting right on our hip, sitting mm -hmm. right on our kitchen table. Mm -hmm. We can go all around the world. Uh, in the article that I wrote to Noah, you are Marylander and have experience here, I described the Potomac River that runs from the capital all the way down to the Chesapeake Bay. Right. I described the Patuxent River and one of my mentors, a William Diggs, said, Vince, that is the cradle of African-American mm -hmm. civilization in the Americas. Right. I went on to describe those two rivers as ancient rivers. Put a pen in that. Well, I spun my computer around and typed in ancient rivers. And it began to talk about the Tigris and the Euphrates. Mm -hmm. They began to talk about the Amazon. They began to talk about the Ganges River and the great rivers of India and the great rivers of China. And then I Googled a little bit more and these riv rivers go back 12 million years. Doc, let me say it again. 12. So Yes, sometimes my accent gets in the way. I told you I'm a country boy from East Baltimore. 12 million years. And our USA on a good day might be uh, 400 years, four and a quarter, 430. You might get to 440. Depends on how you're counting with Vastez Gomez and the right. Mexican came over. And then those that came even before then. So we are really the new boy and new girl on the block when right, they have right. covered fossils and tent poles and teepees and artifacts and oyster minions piled up as, as high as the office building. Ancient rivers. Do you think because the Native Americans, we don't know their story because they won't allow people to tell it. They won't allow black people to tell the complete story. Is it, this sounds like a pattern. Yes, yes. And again, uh, to a certain degree, knowledge is power, but that's not the whole story. Applied knowledge is power. Right. And I think that when I read back about Carter G. Woodson, we talked about uh, this is really the kickoff of Black History Month with uh, Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass's birthday. 
And even when I was in grade school in the uh, late 50s and 60s in Baltimore, they had Negro History Week. And now we've expanded to a month, but I say 24-7, 365. Right. We're just so far behind and we don't have to wait for anyone to tell us now is the time to put on the black movies. Now is the time mm-hmm. to uh, showcase the black artists. Now is the time to pull out the black artifacts. It should be 24-7, 365 and share it with the young people. Because one thing that my mentors have taught me, if you want something remembered, tell it to the children. Mm-hmm. But you know, this month you have these, these, you know, these streaming stations, they will allow you to play a black story for free this month. Oh, goody. Thank you. Thank you, Publication, for allowing you to stream our movies for free this month. <laughs> yes. And, and what I think, even going back to Noah, I think that uh, even with the work that I do, uh, I'm going to tell you where we have been, what it was like, but I'm not going to leave you there because I can't get stuck there. Right. My story is going to shift to a story of resiliency mm-hmm. that in spite of your knee on my neck, I rise. That's the story. And that's why I took the story to show that from where we started to where we are now, but we've come a mighty long way, but we also have a mighty long way to go because what the record shows doc is we've always achieved as individuals. The record is overwhelming. But we need to achieve as a group. We need to achieve as a group. Now, with that. (laughs) And just one quick point. But they don't let us achieve as a group. But when we mess up, we mess up as a group. As a group. Yeah. We don't mess up individually. We mess up as a group. Now, we're going to talk more this month. and, And again, because, I mean, this type of conversation live anyway. But we need funding from different federal organizations to help us preserve and to tell the story, but they're still reluctant to open up the money they have had for such a long time to give it to something so beautiful as our story to be spoken. How do we get them to open up those chains purses? I think a big part of it is through uh, collaborations and partnerships. Okay. Okay. Because one of the things, even as you and myself conversations have gone, I mean, you bring a set of skills to the table. I bring a set of skills to the table, but the funders want to talk to the accountant. Mm -hmm. They don't want to talk to you. They don't want to talk to me. (laughs) One of them got to be able to add the columns up, make the reporting deadlines, present the metrics, as it related to the goals and objectives. And I think that's where a lot of their fear is because they may have had some experience along the way where it just didn't work out. Gotcha. And somebody got fired or somebody got demoted or somebody didn't get promoted because it all didn't work out and they have been reprimanded. So they are a little skittish. And so when I talk about partnerships, my academic background is not finance. Me and mine. Yours, but I'll say to you, we better have a strong financial officer on the team, clearly identified with a record of not only dealing in millions, but dealing in pennies and quarters. Mm-hmm because I've seen some Wall Streets and head friends guys that, that you know, when the, when the photographers say, we're gonna take a picture one, two, three, the congressman said, hold up. We don't smile on one, two, three. We smile on one <laughs> billion, billion and three billion. <laughs> so there are people from that world, but they can't balance your grandkids checkbook. Right, right. 
because again, that brings in a whole different level of detail and accountability. So I think that that's a big part of it through teaming and collaboration because none of us have the whole package, no matter what right. we think. Well, I know we all need, I, I know I don't have the whole package. I know we need each other. I know we I always say we can't do this without each other, but it, uh, not, but there's people out there who are walking forward and, and trying to get this done. And yet we don't have enough support either from the whole people, the collaborative people, and from the people with the money who aren't part of our people. <laughs> so... <laughs> I know I've worked with some people that have gotten mega grants and things from the Ford Foundation and those kind of things. And mm. they would go into New York or regional office and sit down and talk to the program officers. They aren't sending certified packets through the mail. Right, They're right. sitting down, talking with program officers, uh, asking, can I see examples of programs that have been successfully funded? Uh, do you have any resource people that you think you think meaning you got a comfort level with that can enhance right. this proposal or project. So I think that those are techniques and strategies that we need to implement and teach them to others. Well, more to talk about, more to do, always more to do, 365, 24 hours a day. I love you, Mr. Vince Leggett. Um, and this show is kicking off when? The the, the virtual show? Uh, that's uh, coming out on February 15th, we'll be doing a program called Black Captains of the Chesapeake, and it's going to be a Zoom program, and uh, they are trying to expand the uh, bandwidth of the Zoom because the popularity has far exceeded the host. Where can they catch on? Do they go on to the, um, which, which, which website and, and which Facebook site? It would be the uh, Blacks of the Chesapeake's Facebook account or directly to the Queen Anne's County, Maryland library system. They're hosting the Black Captains of the Chesapeake where we'll be showing a mini uh, documentary film and then having a very lively discussion following viewing the film. All right, I know I'll be there and hope everyone else join us too for the um, Blacks in the Chesapeake Bay. So on the 15th, you'll have to go to the different sites and type it in and, and get there and click on the zoom. This is, over, this is going to be recorded. So hopefully we can keep this in the schools so they can watch yeah. it too. Cause that's important. Remember we got to teach it to the children. So. Yeah. And thank uh, you for all you do doc for, for holding up the bloodstained banner. I appreciate you, sir. Thank you, brother. Love you. Love you too.